chapter number four, Joshua chapter number four. For several weeks, I've been wanting to um, start a series. I wasn't exactly sure when the Lord wanted me to start it, but I felt yesterday that the Lord was leading me and prompting me to go ahead and do uh, the series that we are about to uh, begin this evening. I don't know if what maybe is just the uh, the Christian school and all that's surrounding that and just the, the adversity that we've had to deal with. Maybe that's just what it took to kind of um, tilt the scales, if you will. When I got the text message on a Friday night and then several pastors reached out to me in the area that have Christian schools, we um, were all um, in a bit of a tizzy, to say the least, um, when I, I went to Christian school, um, kindergarten, I think through fourth grade, and then my parents were missionaries in the Samoan Islands and the Hawaiian Islands, and we homeschooled those years, and then came back uh, to the States in, um, I think it was 89, and I went to Christian school uh, my junior, senior year. And I was actually thinking about it this afternoon. Worked two jobs in high school to pay my own tuition to Christian school. My parents couldn't afford it, but I wanted to go. It was important to me. It was important to them. From the time I was 15, I worked two jobs uh, to pay my own tuition to go back to school. And um, senior year, I worked at Burger King, worked a paper route with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, got up every morning about four o'clock, delivered newspapers, and um, on the weekends I did, uh, uh, Saturday and Sunday, I had to get up at four o'clock to have them all delivered by about six or seven, and then I'd go back and sleep about an hour or two and then get up and go to church, but Monday through Friday I had to go after school. As soon as school was over, I'd jump in the car, go get, load my newspapers up, and go deliver newspapers, a seven-day-a-week job. I did it for several years, paid my way through Christian school, uh, and I got off to my paper route, then I went to Burger King and worked till dark. I did that uh, because Christian education was important to me even as a kid. It's important to me now. And I, I think homeschool is phenomenal. I have absolutely no problem with homeschool unless it's not done right. If it's not done right, it drives me up the wall. Uh, but I think homeschool done right uh, is, is, is great. Not everybody can do that. Not every parent or mom or family has the ability and the setup to be able to do that. I, I've never, ever discouraged anybody from homeschooling as long as I, I, they did it right. And I say do it right. I mean get up in the morning and do your schoolwork and don't, don't lay around in the bed all day and uh, do, your, do your schoolwork uh, in your pajamas eating Fruit Loops at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I just That kind of stuff drives me crazy. Uh, but if you're going to do it, do it right. But most people, their alternatives are either is, is a public school. I call it government school. Yeah. It's a government school. And what you're seeing in the streets of America right now is the product yeah. of public school, government school. It's the product of Hollywood. They took, they took God out of school. They took prayer out of school. Um, they, they, they read Dr. Spock back in the 70s and didn't believe in discipline and, and training their children. Um, they, they, they started aborting babies, wholesale slaughter of the unborn, teaching children that they evolved from monkeys. And we wonder why we have what we have today. It's no mystery uh, when you look at it through that lens, but I'm grateful that here at Calvary Baptist Church for over 40 years we've had a Christian school. We've had an alternative for parents to be able to send their children, make that additional sacrifice. And many of you, if you own property, you pay taxes and it goes to the school. You fund and pay for the public school system. And you turn right around and pay tuition on top of that. And I commend you for your sacrifice. And, but we've had this here for over 40 years. And now um, we're looking at the possibility. It is uh, Montgomery County just came out on Monday, uh, on, on Friday evening, and this will be a this will be a huge matter of debate, I'm sure, especially since the governor uh, came out uh, yesterday, uh, strongly opposing the counties from shutting down and prohibiting the reopening of private schools. 
Um, I'm a bit confused because of the double standard that our dear governor has set. He had no problem with local municipalities shutting down churches. Now he's got a problem with them shutting down schools. I'm going to guess maybe his kids go to a private school. That would be my guess, but I may be wrong. I don't know if he even has kids. Uh, but many times that ends up being the case. People make decisions based on how it affects them. But I, the, 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 the opening of churches was protected in the First Amendment of the, of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. Um, but our school is a ministry of this church. It is an outreach ministry of this church. And the debate has already begun as to whether or not it's even legal to shut down a, a, a private school that is a ministry of a church. I don't think it is. I've been in touch with our attorneys, our lawyers, and they are ready to represent us if we decide to go in that direction to challenge that should Baltimore County come up with that. I know I'm probably being watched right now, which don't matter to me. I don't care. We don't do anything in the secret around here in the dark anyway. But, but uh, you know, the, 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 the Montgomery County, it won't surprise me if PG County, Arundel County, uh, and who knows Baltimore County. Uh, of course, our county, uh, our county health department head, uh, Dr. Gregory Branch, right now uh, is down with the COVID. And so um, we need to pray for him. But in any case... Uh, I, I hope and pray that they don't put us in a position where we have to make that decision. I plan on meeting with the deacons after the service tonight and, and just kind of all of us get on the same page. But I'm just going to be honest with you. It's worth fighting. It's worth fighting to protect our church's right and ability to train our children. Train our children. I just saw, I just saw on, uh, a friend of mine just posted something a few minutes ago as I was trying to log on to the church's Facebook page and share that, and I encourage you to do that even though you're here, it'd be nice if you go on and share that and check in, it gets more viewers. We've got people all over the world watching our services because during the shutdown you were sharing that and it really, it really was a blessing. But in any case, when I was doing that, I noticed a preacher friend of mine uh, said that now in the state he's in, uh, that it's gonna be mandatory in the curriculum for them to teach the history of the LGBTQ in the school which uh, we, we teach the Bible, so we've been teaching that for years about Sodom and Gomorrah. We know how it started and what God thinks about it, but I don't think that's exactly the kind of history that they want us to be uh, teaching. And I know that's not the history they're gonna be teaching in the public schools. And so uh, um, just, just please forgive me if I come across as very blunt, uh, but I wouldn't send my dog to a public school these days. I, would, I, I love little Charlie too much to do that to him. I would not subject him to the, the Marxism, the socialism, the atheism, the humanism, um, the, 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 uh, the, the ungodly the propaganda. It's become a, 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 a brainwashing institution and I, I, I'd rather my children be illiterate. I've said it for years. I'd rather my children be illiterate, be completely unable to read and write than to be the product of government school. I just, I seriously believe that. So uh, I just need us to pray I'm saying all this as part of my message because I want it to go out. Brother Tim, I want this part of my message. Don't cut this part out when you post it on YouTube. I want this out. Our church has a Christian school, has had one for over 40 years, and it has no, the government has no jurisdiction over this Christian school. Amen. Amen. The Department of Education has no jurisdiction over our Christian school. Amen. We as parents... We as parents have made the decision to cut the government and all their cronies out of the education process. Our teachers, most of our teachers, if not all of them are mothers and right here in our church and our congregation and are doing a fantastic job. You wouldn't believe kids come to our school from the public school and we take, it takes several months to get them up to par where they're supposed to be on their grade level. They come in here and they're so far behind, it's pathetic. It's pathetic. And our school may not be big, but I can guarantee you one thing, our children get a good education and they're taught, they're taught uh, wholesome uh, things like patriotism, love of God, love of country. We start every day out with the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. 
amen, and they put their hands over their heart, and we pledge allegiance to the Christian flag, we pledge allegiance to the Bible, and I mean, we just, we just absolutely have a great time. We have chapel every week. We have somebody in here, some fire-breathing preacher, whether me or somebody else comes in here, we preach a hide off these kids, and we have invitation. They flood the altars and, and make commitments. Kids get saved during the school year. Kids get right with God during the school year. I mean, hey, we don't play when it comes to our young people. We don't play. Dead serious, dead serious. And so all that right now is in jeopardy. I guess that's one reason why I feel compelled to begin this series entitled Shaping the Next Generation. Shaping the Next Generation. It is our responsibility as Christians to pass down that faith that has that earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Our young people need to know the truth. And, if they're, and they're not going to get it from the world. They're not going to get it. I was listening to a radio broadcast. I'm going to get in the message here in just a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be in Joshua 4 here in just a minute. I, I wasn't going to preach long because I'm wore out. My throat's hurting, but I got up here and got to talk, and I'm fired up. So I don't think about my throat too much right now. But if we're, if we're waiting for the lost people, if we're waiting for the socialists and the Marxists, I mean, two-thirds of the protesters that they've arrested in Portland were public school teachers. Two-thirds, if not 75% of the Antifa uh, protesters, that they, the rioters, there's a difference, by the way, in protesters and rioters. Two-thirds of them public school teachers. Now, that's where people are sending their children to go and sit all day in a classroom with somebody that's trying to burn down a federal courthouse writing graffiti, profanity all over the walls and all over the police cars and breaking out windshields and throwing water bottles at police officers, that's the public school teachers. Could you imagine, could you imagine the holy terror that you must deal with when you get your kids come home from school in the afternoon, what they've been dealt with, what they've been pumped into their heads and into their hearts and the hatred and the vitriol? Breaks my heart. Breaks my heart to see all this dialogue. They got little kids, three, four, five, six years old, have no business whatsoever even knowing what racism is. They don't know what racism is. They don't have no idea what racism is. They don't care what their little friend's skin color is, but they listen to all the adults talk and they're watching the television and it's entering their little hearts and their minds and it's perverting and distorting how they think. Makes me sick to my stomach. Here at Calvary Baptist Church, we do our best to just be, be biblical, be patriotic, teach history the way it happened, not the way we wished it had happened. Amen. We just, it, it, it's history. It's what happened. You say, well, I don't like that. It happened thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago. Let's learn from our mistakes and go on. But you can't rewrite history. You can't rewrite history. Trying to rewrite everything. They change math. It's common core math. Watching them do a multiplication problem, common core. I could wash my car and detail it by the time they get done. It's unbelievable. I mean, I'm trying to be nice, but it's unbelievable how stupid our educational system has become. And they're dumbing down everything. And science, they call, talk about science. I always talk about science. They wouldn't know science if it slapped them in the face. Their definition of science is that there's 57 genders. How'd you like to have that scientist teaching that? And that a baby is not a, a human being until it's born. Of course, there, if there's water, one molecule of water on Mars, there's life on Mars, but an unborn baby's not life. Go figure. These people say this stuff with a straight face. We've only got 10 years left and this planet's over as we know it. They don't have not read the Bible. The Bible says that God has reserved this earth under judgment. Nobody's gonna destroy this planet. God says, I'm gonna be the one to get to do that. 
We didn't get here from a big bang. We didn't evolve from some a glob of goo that crawled up out of the ocean. No, we were fearfully and wonderfully made and God is our designer and God is our creator. And we teach our children that. We teach them that the God that made them and created them, created them with a purpose and a plan. And it's not all about survival of the fittest. And the government doesn't like that. Don't like that. And so don't be surprised if that don't, end up being the decision we have to make here in the next few days. Well, anyway, I'm going to preach for a little bit on shaping the next generation. Y'all okay? Everybody okay? Take a deep breath. If you need to take your mask down, take a deep breath, put your mask back on. Joshua chapter number four, this entire chapter is all about one thing, shaping the next generation. Starts out in Verse number one, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. It's 24 verses. Came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan. The Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you out 12 men out of the people, out of uh, every tribe of man, and command you them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, 12 stones. You shall carry them over with you. And leave them in the lodging place. We shall lodge this night. Look at what it says in verse number six, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what mean ye by these stones? And you shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And when it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. Look at verse number 20. And these 12 stones which they took out of Jordan to Joshua pitch in Gilgal, and he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, when your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what mean these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you might fear the Lord your God forever. We're gonna preach a little bit out of this chapter on shaping the next generation, part one. Lord, help us as we open the scriptures. I pray that you'd be glorified, magnified, and may the message tonight resonate in the hearts of your people. Challenge and stir us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Three things I want you to notice tonight. Number one, write this down, the labor that was involved. We're gonna look at the labor that was involved in shaping the next generation. Nobody ever said it was easy but it's got to be done. A couple of things I want you to notice in this passage of scripture. As I read this chapter several times this afternoon, I noticed something I don't think I had noticed before. If I knew it, I forgot it. So I had to learn it all over again. And I thought, man, that's, I, don't remember, I don't remember it being like this. And so I text three or four preacher friends of mine that I've got respect for, that walk with God and know their Bible. I said, am I right on this? And every single one of them takes me back and said, that's exactly what it says. I said, well, I praise the Lord, I was right for a change, amen. And so, if you don't agree with what I'm saying, amen, we got you outnumbered up here tonight. But three things, a couple things I want you to notice about this, this, this story, and that is this. Stay with me now. I, I, I didn't read all 24 verses because we can look at most of them throughout the course of the message, but the Bible tells us in verse number nine, Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of Jordan. Is that what your Bible says? In the place where the feet of the priest which bear the Ark of the Covenant stood. And there uh, they are unto this day. Is that what your Bible says? So we know they're going to cross over Jordan to go into the land of Canaan. I don't have time to give you the whole history leading up to why they're crossing over. We ain't dealing with that tonight. I'm dealing with these, this memorial. I'm dealing with this, these 12 rocks that they set up. God told them to set up these 12 rocks. And they set up, Joshua set up 12 stones, the Bible says, in the midst of Jordan. Verse number nine, and there they are unto this day. They built a memorial in the middle of the river. Is that what your Bible says? But then you get over to verse number 20, and these 12 stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch at Gilgal. And he spake to the children of Israel, saying, when your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what mean these stones? Meaning they built two memorials, one in the middle of the river, and one on dry land in Gilgal. Right, 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 right. I don't remember really noticing that. I don't know if I've heard anybody preach about that. But in any case, that's what happened. 
Why? Because the Bible says in verse 9, the one in the middle of the river is still there. Or at least it was still there when the book was written. Well, notice the thing just about the labor, the work that went into it. As I begin to just think about the, 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 the labor, I'm talking about preparing, the, 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 uh, the, the shaping the next generation. As I begin to think about the labor that is involved, I've got five children. I'm gonna tell you, it's not easy shaping the next generation. We've got school teachers here. It's not easy shaping the next generation. Sunday school teachers that pour their heart and soul into these little children, it's not easy. The labor that's involved, three things I want you to notice, uh, subpoints under this point. Notice the preparation in verse number four. The Bible says Joshua called the 12 men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe a man. Joshua handpicked 12 men, took some planning. The Bible says it took some preparation out of verse number four. I don't know that it required an enormous amount of preparation to get these 12 men lined out, but he had to do a little bit of research. He had to make sure they were able, capable of being able to perform the task that was about to be asked of them. So preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying that it's not a spasmodic last minute idea shaping the next generation. My wife and I began preparing to raise our children for God before they were born. I began preparing to raise my children for God before I was married. Amen. I'll never forget my 11th grade teacher, homeroom teacher said, uh, I said, Stacy, which, which do you want first, a boy or a girl? I said, a wife. <laughs> but seriously, as a, as a teenage boy, if I went to a yard sale and I saw a box of children's books, I bought them for my kids because I love to read. I was always reading. I had always had a book in my hand, had two or three books throughout the house. Wherever I was at, that's the book I was reading. I always was reading, and I just wanted my children to read. I was buying children's books before I got married so my kids would be readers. Amen. My wife and I made big decisions when we first got married based on how it was going to affect the spiritual outcome of our children. Say, so what are you saying? I'm saying that shaping the next generation going to require preparation and planning. I noticed the process. God concocted this idea of the memorial. The man of God communicated the idea of the memorial, but it was the men that carried it out. What about that? And it began in the heart and mind of God for us to raise our children in the way they ought to go, train them up in the way they ought to go. I've got several series I've preached, messages I've preached on child training. My wife and I, it's a passion of ours, training our children. We got serious about training our kids. When we were on deputation, two of our kids were in diapers, spent a lot of time in the van and car seats and churches, and we started noticing our children weren't as trained as we wanted them to be. They weren't as trained as they could be, and we started getting serious about child training, meaning when you tell your child, sit down and don't get up, they sit down and don't get up till you tell them to. If they, don't, if they can't do that, they're not trained. If you say, sit right there and don't say a word, and they sit there and don't say a word, they're trained. If they don't, if they don't do that, they're not trained. And if they're not trained, it's your fault because you're the one supposed to be doing the training. And we got serious about child training. We got serious about teaching our children. We got serious about instilling within them some biblical principles. And I'm telling you right now, it takes, it's, a, it's a lot of work. It requires a lot of preparation. Read a lot of books. Talked to a lot of people. Listened to a lot of preaching. Read a lot of Bible. Did a lot of praying. I'm not saying we got it 100% right. I'm just saying that shaping the next generation takes work. I, I already lost all y'all. Y'all demoralized already, ain't you? You wish you could do it with a remote, but you can't. The preparation, we see the pain. Verse number five, he said in verse number five, Joshua said, pass over before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of Jordan and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of of the tribes of the children of Israel. So if I understand this correctly, they picked up 12 stones off the, off the wilderness side of Jordan and carried them into the middle of the river and they built a memorial in the middle of the river. Then they picked 12 stones up out of the middle of the river and took them up on dry land and built another one. And they were big stones. They, they, they didn't have a little pocket full of pea gravel. Now these, these weren't little rocks. They were stones. It was big enough stones that he said you're going to carry them on your shoulder. 
I mean, they had to get them things up on their shoulder and they had to carry them. You say, preacher, what I'm saying? I'm saying there was some pain involved. There was a lot of work, took a lot of effort. There was a lot of commitment. There was some discomfort along the way carrying those stones, but they were willing to do that to pay the price so that their children could have a memorial and know all about God. It's inconvenient sometimes being the right kind of parent. It's inconvenient. It's uncomfortable. And I'm not just talking about when their baby's waking up at two o'clock in, in the morning crying, needing their, a bottle or needing their diaper changed or needing to be nursed. No, I'm talking about all the way on up until they're out of the house. Sometimes it's discomforting. It, it, it's, dis, it's uncomfortable is what I meant to say. It's uncomfortable. You have to deal with some discomfort many times to, 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 to crucify your flesh and put things you want to do aside so that you can focus on your children. It's, sometimes it's painful, which is why many parents never... Make the sacrifice. Too much trouble. Too much trouble. Just park them in front of the boob tube, put SpongeBob SquarePants on, and forget about them. It's amazing. It's amazing how many people have children, but they never, ever interact with their children. They get up in the morning to go to work, take the kids, drop them off at the babysitters or the daycare or the school, pick them up drop them off somewhere else, stick them in front of the TV. All they ever do is tuck them into bed. That's about it. Very little parenting is going on this day. You say, preacher, why do you, how do you know? Because they're down here all day. We know. It shows what you're doing and not doing at the house. And you see the preparation. I'm talking about the labor. We see the pain. Thirdly, we see the pitching in verse number 20. These 12 stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. Now don't misunderstand that. They didn't just walk over and throw them down. That word pitch means to raise, to build, to erect, to set up. There was some forethought. There was some effort. There was some, there was some, there was some method to the madness, if I can say it. These 12 stones, they set these things up in such a way that they would be there for a very, very long time. They didn't all just say, Oh, man, and throw it off their shoulder. I'm glad that's over with. Let's go swimming. Let's go hunting. Let's go fishing. No, they, they, they got together and they built a memorial. It took some time and effort. Preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying the labor that's involved to, sh to shape the next generation has got to be done on purpose. A lot of planning, a lot of foresight, a lot of thought, a lot of prayer, a lot of intentional conversations. A lot of confrontations. I'm amazed at how many parents are opposed to confrontations with their children. They're so non-confrontational, the kids get away with bloody murder and parents won't say anything. They won't even confront them when they're three years old pitching a fit in the floor. What you gonna do when they're 13? And they want their girlfriend to move in in the basement. Then what you gonna say? You ain't never told them no. You can't start now. Amazing to me that parents let kids completely dominate and run their life. I never cease to be amazed that people say, well, we can't come to church on Wednesday night because our kids have to do this and our kids have to do that. I just shake my head and go, wow, bless your heart. I can't imagine my life revolving around my children and their schedule. Our kids go where we go. They went where we went. They did what we did. If they got sleepy, they slept wherever we was at. Amen. My parents wasn't home from church six o'clock at night to have me in bed. I slept under the church pew most time I was growing up. I didn't even know. I thought that was a bed up under there. I thought I, was, I, thought I had bunk beds. I was under the pew and my sister was on top of it. We didn't know. We didn't know. They went, if they wanted to go to a revival meeting two hours away, they, they went to a revival meeting two hours away. We slept under the pew. We slept on the car, in the car coming back. They'd just pick us up in carriage, put us in our bed, and we'd go back to sleep. They, they didn't revolve, their life didn't revolve around us. I'm amazed how many kids run the house. Read Isaiah 3 when you get home. That was foretold. The children shall be princes among them. Kids run the house. They, they've been running the house. They've been running the schools. That's why they're doing what they're doing in the streets. And nobody ever told them they wasn't in charge. Nobody ever told them to sit down and be quiet. 
Their parents were never the authority. The, school, the, te the teachers at the school were never the authority. And now the police is not even the authority. They have no idea what it means to be told to do something they don't want to do or stop doing something that they're doing. Terrible parenting. I, I, you got to wonder what the parents of these kids think sitting there watching their children on the news, screaming, pitching a fit, and, and up in police officers' face, screaming, cussing, and threatening them, talking filthy. I can't imagine seeing my kids. I, I'd, I'd shoot myself if my kids was doing that. But it's their fault. They didn't raise them any better. I may be being just a tad too transparent tonight. I, um, the labor that was involved. Number two, we see the legacy that was initiated. There was a legacy, the memorial. You, several times we see that word here in, in this passage of scripture about a memorial. They was, they, was, they was interested in establishing a legacy for their children. Something that would, something that would stand the test of time. Something that, would, something that would last for a while. A couple things I want you to notice about the legacy that was initiated. Verse uh, 21, notice the fathers. It says in verse number 21, when the, your children shall ask their fathers. Is that what your Bible says? I know today, and it's 2020, I know we got a lot of family dynamics. We got a lot of broken homes. We got a lot of mothers that are raising children without a dad for whatever the reason. We got men raising children without a mother. I understand that. My heart goes out to you for that. I sympathize with you. And I know that God can help you and God can, God can work in your family. But can we just be honest and say from this pulpit that God's plan was for every family to have a daddy and a mama that was sold out, serving God together, raising their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Can we not say? that that was God's plan? It is God's plan. God can work through your difficulties. He can work in and around and through your circumstances. I would never say otherwise. But I think many times pastors and preachers in their efforts to not try to make somebody feel bad or to make somebody feel uncomfortable, they avoid the obvious points in the scripture and that is these children were going to their father for spiritual questions. That's where the Head of the home is supposed to be. You might as well say amen. I'm old school. The husband is the head of the home. That's what the Bible says. And it's the husband's job. It's the daddy's job. Fathers, the Bible says, raise your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Daddy's got to be the spiritual leader. And when he's not the spiritual leader, then the mother, by default, has to be the spiritual leader. Obviously. Obviously, God's plan would be for the father and the mother to be in sync, working together in tandem, teaching their children, strengthening them from both sides. God knows what he's doing. He put that, hopefully put that balance in place, that, that law and grace. I'm law and my wife's grace. Well, there's been a few times I was maybe a little bit too gracious and she had to step up and be the law. There's a few times they came to me and said, can we do this? And I said, well, I guess that's fine. And my wife would say, uh, we need to talk a minute. And then she would enlighten me on something I didn't know and quickly it changed my mind. Amen. We were working together. Yeah. Amen. My wife, my wife holds me accountable. I thank God for my wife. I'm where I'm at today because of her. So oh, preacher, I can't see you ever compromising or backing up. I might would if I didn't have a wife like I got. Amen. I should be honest, men, we get lazy sometimes. I said we get lazy sometimes. But you notice the fathers. I couldn't help but notice in, verse, in chapter 4. Look at what he says. Verse 2, take you 12 men out of the people, out of every tribe of man. Look at verse 4. When Joshua called the 12 men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe of man. God said, I need 12 men. I get, so, I get so tickled. I'm being nice. At this, these liberals that keep saying that gender is fluid, but that Joe Biden has to pick a female vice president. Like, is there such a thing as a woman or not? 
I wonder how they'd like it if he picked a female and if he won, as soon as he got inaugurated, she decided she wanted to be a man. I wonder how they'd like them apples. Preacher, what are you doing? I'm having fun. What are you doing? God said, I need a man. A man. He said, he said fathers, when your children, when your fathers, uh, when the children shall ask their fathers in time to come. And I'm, I'm gonna say this to you daddies. Your kids are gonna come to you and ask you questions about the Bible and about life and about God. You better have the right answer. <laughs> Some of y'all are just as nervous as you can be. Preacher, I can't believe you're saying all this. Notice, y'all are worried about that cancel culture. They ain't gonna cancel me, they can't. I don't work for them. <laughs> I want to see them try to cancel me. Everybody's so wadded up about getting canceled. Everybody okay? I'm not worried about getting canceled. That's my least concern. I just want to help our parents understand the importance of raising godly children. Notice the fathers. Notice the future, verse 21. He said in verse 21, when your children shall ask their fathers in time to come. That memorial is going to be there. They're going to walk by it a hundred times and never think twice about it. But there's going to come a day when they say, I wonder what this is all about. <laughs> You're going to sit in this church. Your kids are going to go to this school. And they may be here 5, 10, 12 years. And one day they're going to come home from chapel. One day they're going to come home from church. And they're going to say, Daddy, I need to talk to you. You need to be ready for that day in time to come when they come to you and ask you we see the future God was always thinking ahead God wanted them to think long term long term a lot of parents I think that make some radical changes in their life in their family and in their home if they understood the long term effect that it was having on their kids oh, my kids two years old three years old they don't know what's going on sure they do Sure they do. They're listening to you talk. They're listening to the language you're using, the tone you're using. They're watching what you're watching on TV. And then one day they're going to be older and you're going to be confronted with the realization you didn't think long term. You didn't think long term. If you want your children to be walking with God when they're 21, teach them to walk with God when they're one. We had five kids and not a single one of them went through the terrible twos. Not one of them. Terrible twos. Oh, my kids are in those terrible twos. We had five. Never, am I right, Mama? Never went through the terrible twos. They learned to mind when they were one. And when they were two, they didn't know they were two. Nobody told them that at two you can act like an idiot. <laughs> they had no idea when they turned two that that meant they could pitch a fit, jump up and down, scream, holler, slap people, snatch your glasses off their face. You say, don't do that, and they snatch your glasses off your face again. You're holding them, and he pull, one time, they pull my glasses off. One time. Never did it again. We never did child-proof our house. We house-proofed our children. We left the ceramic figurines on the coffee table, and they just didn't touch them. You want them to obey you when they're 18? Do you want them to listen to you when they're 16? Well, you better, you better be thinking about that when they're one. Because you can't wait till they're 13, 14, and 15 and then start tightening down on them. They'll run away from home. You better think long term. I wish I had time to go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse number 9 and 10, where God said, I am going to take time. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligent, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, lest they depart from thy heart and all the days of thy life, but teach them to thy sons and thy sons' sons. Deuteronomy 6, 2, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all of his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy sons' sons, all the day of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. Notice the future. Notice the fathers. Notice in verse 22, the familiarity. Then ye shall let your children know. 
They're going to come to you and ask questions. The day's going to come, sometime in the future, when they're going to come to you, and you better be ready for an answer. And it's going to be your job to cause them to become familiar with the things of God. It's amazing. It's amazing. The Bible is so amazing. Ephesians 6, 4, You fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Your children are not going to know about God if you don't teach them. Well, we pay the tuition, send them down here to this Christian school. No, it's your job to teach them about God. It's our job to just back you up and reinforce it. It's sad, but we got many kids in our school, you can tell they're not getting it at home. In fact, they come in here and break the rules and look at us crazy when we call them on it because they have no idea how to live the Christian life. They're not being taught that at home. I guess what I'm trying to say is this. We can only do so much here at church and in the Christian school. We can only do so much. Parents, it is your responsibility to train your children. It is your responsibility to shape your children, mold them, train them up in the way they should go. We see the labor that was involved, the legacy that was initiated, and thirdly, we see the life that was instructed. Look at what he says in verse number 22 and down. When your children come to you, then you shall let your children know, verse 22, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until ye were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea. Two things I saw he repeated in verse number 23. Twice he said for the Lord your God. <laughs> he didn't say tell your children the Lord our God did this. You better make sure that your God becomes your children's God. You better make sure that the Jesus that you say you love, that your children fall in love with that Jesus. You better make sure that the God that you say directs your path and, and makes your life worth living, make sure he becomes their God as well. Amen. Don't go off and leave them. Amen. Bring them along. Bring them along on the journey. It's critical that our God becomes the God of our children. Not only do we see the personal reference in verse 23, for the Lord your God twice, but we see the pattern remembered. He said, tell your children that God brought us over Jordan on dry land, just like he brought us through the Red Sea on dry land. You let them know that God has a pattern of blessing and helping and miracles and doing amazing things. You let them know they don't want to live their life without this God, our God, your God, working in your life. When they see this stack of rocks, they're going to say, what's the meaning of this? Set them down, give them a history lesson. Give them a history lesson. The older I get, the greater I value my heritage. Amen. Just a few weeks ago, we had the privilege of having with us Dr. Sammy Allen sit right there in that middle chair and preached his heart out 30 or 40 minutes. I had a strong impression, strong impression that if I didn't get him the weekend I got him, I wasn't going to get him. I, don't, I, I can't explain it. I mean, it was on me so bad, I called on a, on a Monday. I remember they were all in the office when I come running in there like a kid at Christmas. I said, y'all ain't going to believe who I just got scheduled to be here this Sunday. I said, Brother Sammy. They said, how'd you do that? I said, I just called. He's been down with the COVID for the last three or four weeks, and he's bad off. I mean, we're praying God to pull him out of it. Yeah. But a lady we know, pastor's wife, or missionary's wife, Rock of Ages, wife passed away yesterday. We was praying for her, and she passed away. She was in her 40s. Brother Sammy, he's on up. I mean, I'm telling you, I hope he's okay. I hope, I hope God touches him and helps him. But when he was sitting right there preaching and I got to sit beside him, I held his hand for much of that message and I watched that man preach. The, 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 the influence that he's had on me since 1976, 
I was just eating it up sitting there next to him. I mean, it was just, I can't explain it. I watch people salivate over these sports stars. I guarantee you I could put in the paper, Michael Jordan was going to be here next Sunday doing a basketball clinic and you wouldn't be able to stir him with a stick over here. And Brother Sammy Allen, been preaching for over 50 years, preached in this church. That's just the recent example. I could stand up here and give you many. And to hear him tell those old stories stirred my heart that the same God that was working back in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, Brother Roth, still working today, 2020. You're not going to see that in the news. You're not going to see that on the front of the newspaper. And I'm telling you right now, we need to set our children down and give them a history lesson and remind them that God has always worked and done great things and he still wants to do it today. Sure, notice the pattern remembered. And lastly, notice the propagation required. He said to them, tell your children, in verse number 24, that all the people of the world might know How's the world going to know? Who's going to tell the whole world what God does right here in Dundalk, Maryland? It's going to be us and our children and our grandchildren. That's who's going to be the one telling it. He said, when your children see this memorial, they're going to come and ask you, what does this mean? He said, you sit down and you give them a little history lesson and then I want you to charge them and commission them to go tell the whole world what God did here. Is that not what your Bible says? I don't think I've ever heard the latter part of Joshua chapter number four ever preached in a missions conference, but that's a missions message right there. If our children are ever going to surrender to the mission field, they're going to have to have a story to tell. Who do you reckon they're going to hear that story from? Come on now. If God's ever going to impress upon them and call them and, and, and commission them to go to some third world country and tell somebody the good news, they're going to have to know the good news. They've got to hear it from us. So if we're going to reach the world, we start by reaching our children. Will that work? I mean, how terrible would it be if we were to reach people's children in China and Japan, Australia and Africa, and our own children die and go to hell? What a tragedy that would be. So we reach the world by reaching our children, shaping the next generation that all the people of the world might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. The life that was instructed when you were sitting there at the foot of that memorial and your children were asking those questions, now is your opportunity to lay it out for them. Past, present, future. What God did, what God wants to do, and what God can do. All right there together. We're going to look at several different messages over the next few weeks, Lord willing, as we dig into this shaping the next generation. And I want parents to listen to me very carefully. You might be here tonight and you say, well, preacher, I don't, I don't have children. These messages are not for me. Sure they are. Sure they are. Your life's going to be impacted by the next generation just like all of ours is. Sure they are. You young people sitting here saying, preacher, I don't know if I want to listen to all this preaching about child training. I still live at home. You need to hear some preaching on child training. But I'm not a child. All right. You'll quit acting like one, we'll quit calling you one. How's that? When I became a man, I put away childish things. I tell you what I believe. I believe the best is yet to come at Calvary Baptist Church. I don't want to think about 65 years of God working here and now it's all about to change. I believe God's wanting to blow the top off this thing. And he will if all of us adults will get our act together. And understand our life, our life, the way we conduct ourselves, the way we live, the way we talk, the way we act, the way we represent ourselves, it's impacting this next generation. Yes, what are they seeing? A bunch of phonies and hypocrites? Or are they seeing people that are genuine, sincere, 
born-again Christians that love God with all their heart, soul, and mind. Would you join me in the altar this evening as we have our invitation? As they play on the instruments, maybe you just want to get down here and say, Lord, help me do my part. Maybe you're a parent, maybe not. Maybe you're a young person. Maybe you're a single person and you've not yet taken that step of marriage and starting a family. And Maybe God now is kind of putting some things on your heart. Won't you get in the altar and talk to God about it? Maybe some of you parents need to go home and make some changes with the way you interact with your children and things you allow in the home things you permit, maybe the way you're training them or not training them. Maybe God spoke to your heart about that tonight. I don't know, just mind the Lord. If you don't have anything else to pray about, would you pray with us about the school? Would you pray with us, please, that they don't try to shut down the school, that we can move forward with the opening that we've got scheduled and watch God do great things this year in the Calvary Baptist School. Would you pray with me, please, about that?